I don't know why, but through my time of teaching the Bible, it seems like it seems as though when a particular group is a little smaller than it usually is, that the Lord just gives us something real special. And uh, I just feel like He's going to do that tonight. I believe I, I believe we're just going to uh, have our hearts thrilled with what uh, what we find from God's Word. Some people are bothered by the seeming variances between the account given in one of the Gospels, one of the four books that we call Gospel, and one of the other of the four, or the other three. There seems to be uh, some words that don't fit. Some want to know why did God give us these four accounts of the uh, ministry and the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why are there so many episodes where the wording is almost exactly the same in two or more of them and in some there's quite some variance? So we're going to explore this tonight. Then we're going to take uh, a story in, the, in each of the four Gospels a story that, that would be fitting for this particular time of the year. It'll be the story of the betrayal in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And I guess traditionally that happened on the Thursday night before the resurrection. Now, I'm not sure that it didn't happen on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night. But traditionally, it happened on a Thursday night, the Thursday night before the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, this is the Thursday night before we celebrate his resurrection. I'm not uh, as much of a devotee of Easter and the Easter season as some are. Uh, of course, the Lord gives us that choice, you know. It says some regard a day and some regard it not. To me, it's, it's a shame that we don't gloriously celebrate every Lord's Day as the resurrection day. Uh, and it seems to detract a little more from the other 51 Lord's Days in the year when we pick out one particularly. And uh, to me, uh, every Lord's Day, every eighth day, you might say, or the day following the seventh, and every week that comes is a glorious opportunity to say he is risen indeed. Well, we're going to start our Bible study in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And we'll be reading first from the 40th chapter. We've said before that Isaiah, being a wondrous book, in many ways is particularly interesting in that it seems to be a, a synopsis of the whole Bible. You'll remember that we pointed out before that there are 66 books in the Bible. Well, there are 66 chapters in Isaiah. We pointed out before that the first 39 chapters of Isaiah tend to correlate to the 39 books of the Old Testament. That is to say, uh, those 39 chapters tell of God and man and man's need and what man is before God and uh, God's judgment and uh, God's uh, prophecy concerning judgment and so forth. And then the last 27 chapters of Isaiah seem to correlate to the 27 chapters of the New Testament in that they give a message of hope and joy, or they tell the gospel, as a matter of fact. Now, if this is true, if you were to, find, if you were to say that the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are like the Old Testament and the last 27 chapters are like the New Testament, then where in Isaiah would you expect to find the prophecy concerning the work of John the Baptist. It would be in the very first chapter of the second part, wouldn't it? Or the 40th chapter. And that's exactly where we find it. In the book of Isaiah. Uh, for instance, in chapter 40, verse 3, you have a verse which is quoted in all four Gospels. And in each of the four Gospels, we are told that this is prophetic of the coming of John the Baptist 
as the herald or the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Notice Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then the fourth and fifth verses, I believe, you will find quoted in the Gospel of Luke. You can find these in each of the... Uh, each of the four Gospels, or at least the third verse in each of the four Gospels. Well, as we read on, we're told what that voice will say, that voice crying in the wilderness. And one thing that he's going to do, he's going to tell the daughters of Zion, or that is, uh, the descendants of Jerusalem, he's going to tell them that they should be on the lookout for someone, and that the message will be, Behold your God, that uh, they will have a message to proclaim to all the land from Jerusalem, and their message will be, or should be, Behold your God. Now you notice this in the ninth verse of the 40th chapter of Isaiah, O Zion, that bringeth good tidings. See, this is the gospel, good, this, this phrase, good tidings, is exactly the same words uh, when carried over to the Greek as our word uh, evangel or our word gospel. Get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Or what the prophet is saying here is that when John the Baptist comes upon the scene and he'll minister there at Jerusalem, which is the city of God, and he will proclaim to the, the uh, inhabitants of Jerusalem that you have a gra glad herald to... Uh, to uh, present to, uh, to the nation of Israel and Judah. And this message will be, you may behold your God. This is a very strange message because we find that the, that the Old Testament people were told that uh, no man could see the face of God and live. And yet God was seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, we see the Father in the Son. And that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, or Emmanuel, Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this was to be the message. Behold your God. Notice those three words, those last three words in verse 9 of the 40th chapter of Isaiah, because we're going to see similar words. Now, if we were to go along in the book of Isaiah, approximately where would you expect to find in Isaiah a prophecy of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. You would expect to find it in the next two or three chapters, wouldn't you? Well, if you look on in chapter 40, beginning with the first verse, you will see uh, a group of scriptures here who, which are quoted in Matthew in the, uh, in the New Testament. And as these verses are quoted there in Matthew, we're told by the writer of Matthew that they describe the type of ministry that Jesus Christ would have on earth. And here the thought is, God saying, Behold my servant. And this has to do with that aspect of the, of the coming of Christ the first time, that aspect in which God says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Or that aspect where the Son was able to say, I do always those things which please the Father. Or uh, when he said, my need is to do the will of the Father. This was what he came for. He became a servant, God's servant, to proclaim God's word. And uh, Paul comments on this in Philippians chapter 2. When, he, when Paul, you remember, said, they're beginning with the fifth verse, and in Philippians chapter 2, that he thought his equality was God, with God was not a thing to be held on to, but he divested himself of his glory, that he might become a servant. We're told that, I believe that, you'll find that Philippians 2, maybe 6, uh, right in there. So we have this message in Isaiah, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighted. This word delighted is translated in the New Testament, well pleased. God says, in whom my soul is well pleased. I have put my uh, spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now then, it, 
then it uh, describes his verse. We're in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 2. He shall not cry, nor lift up his, uh, his, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. <coughs> Yet he shall bring forth judgment in truth. He shall not fail or be discouraged. Now, uh, this language is just simply saying that he's not going to come in like a roaring lion. That he's going to come very quietly, and that uh, it's not, he's not, not going to make a big noise. And that he's not going to harm a soul. That he's not going to come in judgment. That he's going to come quietly as the servant of God. Prophetic descriptions of the ministry of Jesus Christ as he walked the roads of this earth. Now, if you were to find a prophecy in Isaiah, if we could hold out this matter or hold forth this matter, continue in this matter of Isaiah, the last 27 chapters being more or less equal to the, uh, to the New Testament, a little further along, we would expect to find a passage concerning, prophetically concerning his death, wouldn't we? So let's turn on to Isaiah 52. And there, in Isaiah 52, beginning with the 13th verse, and going all the way through the 53rd chapter, that is, uh, a 15 verse section beginning with Isaiah 52 13 and continuing through Isaiah 53 12 you will find the prophetic account of his of his crucifixion the prophetic account of his trial and his crucifixion and his reason uh, for for that notice uh, this uh, sixth verse of the 53rd chapter, for instance, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and his sheep before his shears is done, so he opened not his mouth. You can see the uh, parallel there, can't you? And back over in the 52nd chapter, the 14th verse, and many were astonished at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men, speaking of the, the horrible affliction that was brought upon him at his trial. Now notice in the 13th verse, here God again says, we're in, in Isaiah 52, 13, Behold my servant shall deal prudently, and he shall be exalted and extolled, and, and be very high. Now notice, we found in Isaiah 40, the message was, Behold your God. And then we have had here, in two places, Behold my servant, God says. One aspect of the Christ as a servant was in his life. He served his father. But in his death, he became obedient unto death. And this also you'll find in Philippians chapter 2, in that same passage about the 7th or 8th verse. He became obedient unto death on the cross. So, in the 52nd chapter of Isaiah, obedience concerning his life, the, the, in the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, obedience according to his life, in the 52nd chapter, obedience according to his death. Now, this same uh, prophetic strain is continued in the prophecy by Zechariah. We need to go there, and you won't have a hard time finding Zechariah if you'll find Matthew and go back two, chapter, two books, because it's the next to last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah. The next to the last book in the Old Testament. And we'll be looking into the third chapter of Zechariah. Zechariah 3 8. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows who sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, God is saying through the prophet, Behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. We're continuing the prophetic utterances of God through his prophets concerning Jesus Christ as a servant. Behold, my servant. Now notice this word branch is in capitals, isn't it? 
Well, in the King James Version of the Bible, and in many others, when you see the word capitalized, it wants to emphasize to you the fact that deity is under discussion. This word branch is one of the names of Jehovah, or the pre-incarnate Christ. It's used about six or seven times that I know of in the Old Testament. Twice in Isaiah, twice in Jeremiah, once or twice in Ezekiel, and twice here in, in uh, Zechariah. Now, when we find it again the second time in Zechariah, perhaps we can explore the significance. But right now, I want you to know that the message is, Behold my servant, God says. All right? Zechariah chapter 6. Verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man. You'll find these two word, three words, Behold the man again, in John 19, 5, as they are uttered by Pilate at the, uh, at the trial of Christ. He says, he points his finger at Christ and says, Behold the man. He didn't know that he was speaking for God when he said that. Behold the name, man whose name is what? Whose name is the branch. So there is a man whose name is the branch. But branch again is in capitals, isn't it? And he shall grow up out of his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Well, let's stop just a moment and explain the significance of this word branch. God is seen as a great tree, a great sheltering tree. This figure is often used for uh, men and their kingdoms, but God is seen as a great tree, and each branch is one of his manifestations. For instance, a branch of God is the fact that God is the creator. This is a an aspect of God. He's the creator. Another aspect would be is he is the provident one, or the great provider. Another is that he is Jehovah. That is, God as he has a relationship with human beings. He cares for people. Uh, or you might say uh, a branch out of God would be his, his holiness, his righteousness, his justice. Well, there is one branch of God that is the servant. Now, this uh, is not uh, looked for. You don't look to see a branch of God described as a servant because God and servant doesn't seem to go together. We don't mind having a God who is... Uh, all-powerful. We don't mind having a God uh, who is all-knowing. We don't mind having God who's the creator. But we can't quite conceive of a God who's a servant. But just as surely as Jesus Christ came to this earth, God Almighty, the provident creator, became God the servant. That's a branch of God. That's a manifestation of God. And then, of course, we have here in the sixth chapter... This aspect of God that became a man. It's the Emmanuel aspect of God. God with us. God taking on flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God among us. God the man. And obviously this is none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the branch. He's the branch of God the serpent. And he's the branch of God the man. This is the significance here. Now let's turn on over to Zechariah chapter 9. This is a little little deep, and I hope we're, we're opening it up for you. Uh, Zechariah chapter 9. Now notice, here's another message to Jerusalem, or they in the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold thy king. Behold thy king cometh. Unto thee he is just having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt the foal of an ass. Now here's another aspect of God that people don't exactly want. They want a king, but they don't want a king upon a colt the foal of an ass. They want a king on a white horse. A great prancing white horse. 
The world does not think that a little colt, a donkey colt, is quite the proper conveyance for a king. And the world has to receive him as such. But the world was put on notice 500 years before he came by the prophet Zechariah that when he came, he would come lowly. Why was he coming lowly? It says here, bringing salvation. That's why he came lowly. We, we aren't fit subjects even to be reigned over by God until God first comes and answers our need for a savior. The king must be a savior before he can be a king. And this is how he came. Now you all recognize this as a verse that's quoted in the Palm Sunday story, <coughs> isn't it? This is a, a prophetic of the Palm Sunday story. So why do we have in these passages that we have read here uh, from the Old Testament we have the four Gospels. For in the Gospel of Matthew, the message of God is, Behold your King, the book of Matthew. And in the, in the uh, Gospel of Mark, the message of God is, Behold my servant. And in the uh, Gospel of Luke, the message from God is, Behold the man. And in the Gospel of John, the message from our God is, Behold your God. Now, if you'll read the Gospels with this in mind, that Matthew is the message of God of a king sent and rejected. That Matthew, that Mark, is the message of God concerning the branch of God, his servant. And Luke is the message from God to you concerning the man, Jesus Christ. Throughout the, that book, almost, he's called the Son of Man. The, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19.10 And in the message, and in the Gospel of John, we have God's message to you, saying, Behold, you're God. Now we find this in John's proclamation of him. We find it throughout the books. For instance, in Matthew, the book starts with the genealogy of Christ. And Jesus Christ there in Matthew 1.1 is called the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it gives his ancestry from David down through uh, his earthly father, from whom he received his right, earthly right to the, to the king, to the, to the title to the throne as the king, the son of David. Now, it doesn't give all of the genealogy. It doesn't fit in all of the uh, members of the genealogy previous to Abraham, nor those between Abraham and David. But it minutely describes those from David down because his lineage as king must be shown. The, the king must have the proper pe pedigree or he's not a king. And, of course, his birth is heralded in Matthew. And it's the only book, it's the only one of the four Gospels, uh, where the visit of the earthly kings, the three, we three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts, we travel afar. You won't find that in Mark, nor Luke, nor John. You'll not you'll find that story there. And uh, the Gospel of Matthew, for instance, is the only one in which uh, the, the uh, platform or the, uh, you might say, the uh, order of uh, rule the establishment of the rule is, is brought forth in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the message of the king who came and the king who was rejected. Now let's turn to Matthew chapter 26, and we'll see this borne out in this story that we're talking about. For the story as it's presented in Matthew 26 is filled in with different details than it is elsewhere. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 47. Matthew 26, 47. Perhaps we should read 46 first. You recall that they had been praying, or Christ had been praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, there, uh, just before his trial. This happened on the same night you remember that they were having the Passover in the upper room, and uh, after the Passover was over, Jesus identified Judas 
as the one who would betray him. And Judas left. And after Judas left, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. And then you'll remember that after that, he talked with his disciples, for instance, as they were all gathered around him there in the upper room. He recited those comforting words that we find in John chapter 14, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe. Trust also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. The whole 14th chapter of John were those words which were spoken by Christ in the upper room after Judas had left. And then the last few words in John chapter 14 are these. Arise and let us go hence. And as that group of men, Christ and the 11 remaining apostles, walked, through the city, the city of Jerusalem towards the Mount of Olives, he told them all the words that you will find in John chapters 15 and 16. Then just as he reached the little brook Sidron out of the eastern gate of Jerusalem, he stopped. And he lifted up his uh, head and he prayed to the Father. And you'll find the words of that prayer in the 17th chapter of John. Then after the prayer, he crossed over the brook, went up into the Garden of Gethsemane, which is on the slope of the Mount of Olives. And there was the scene of the agony in the garden. Now we have come to the next scene in this drama. Matthew 26, 46, he says, Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth, doth betray me. <laughs> and while he yet spoke, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great multitude with uh, swords and staves, from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, and hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Now the words that you're going to read here in the 50th verse are not recorded in any of the other three Gospels in this account. Why did God put them here? He put them here because these words are an answer to the prophetic words in Psalm 41.9. Now, if you want to go on a little side adventure, just hold your place in Matthew 26 here and turn back to the book of Psalms, chapter 41. Psalms 41.9. Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. In the first chapter of Acts, Peter said that this psalm was prophetic of what Judas had done. And this, this, these words are quoted in the Gospel of John, I believe. And there's another psalm, uh, Psalm 55, where the uh, episode is elucidated upon somewhat more. But we have here words which were spoken by Jesus back in Matthew now. Friend, mine own familiar friend, that is, why art thou come? You'll only find this account in the Gospel of Matthew. Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him, and behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Now notice, we're not told here which of the ones who were with Jesus did this, are we? doesn't say. And uh, just as a matter of interest, it doesn't say which ear was cut off either, does it? You don't see that. Then beginning with verse 52, you have a very familiar scripture because this is quoted much, even in secular literature. And it's not in any of the other three accounts of this episode. If you want to find it, You'll have to go to the Matthew account, where it says, Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into place. Here's the saying. For all they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. You wouldn't find these words. You wouldn't know that these words had been spoken on this occasion, except for the Matthew account. 53rd verse. You also will not find these words. And this is one of those phrases which let us know that this is the gospel of the king because it's the king who calls forth legions to fight his battles. Now, uh, Christ could have said here, 
Don't you know I could uh, slay these by the word of my mouth? But no, a king calls forth his legions. And this is how uh, uh, Christ will do it when he comes to take over his rulership. You can read the 19th chapter of Revelation. He'll come with all of his heavenly armies to take over this, this world. So this fits only in the gospel of the king, and you'll only find it there. You'll not find it in the other three gospels. Verse 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? These are the words of a king. They certainly wouldn't fit in Mark, where he's the servant. Because a servant would never talk in language like that. I'll call legions of angels. A legion is a military term. And a servant wouldn't call for a legion of angels, would he? It would be out of place. But it's right in place in Matthew. Because Matthew is the gospel of the king. 54th verse. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, and that thus it must be? In the same hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a, a, a thief with swords and spades to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, and all the disciples forsook him and fled. Now let's turn to the Mark account of this same story. It's in Mark 14, Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 51. And the story there is very characteristic of Mark. Mark 14, 51. You'll remember that Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. And the account here is the shortest, except there's an addenda on it which helps lengthen it, which you'll only find in Mark, and we'll discuss that when we get to it. But the reading is substantially the same in Mark as it is in Matthew. But many of the details that are told in Matthew are omitted in Mark because they wouldn't fit in an account by a servant, you might say, or describing the activity of a servant. We're not going to read this entire account, because I said it'll be very much like the other one. Except, notice, at the 50th verse, Mark 14, 50, and they all forsook him and fled. Now here's an interesting little addendum, and you'll only find this in Mark. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now the thought is that this young man was Mark because Mark was a very young man at the time of this and he would have been the only one that knew about it. And uh, so he wrote it in here. He told the detail. He, he knew about it. So he was that young man in all probability. Some say that the guard, that the uh, Mark's mother was a very wealthy person and apparently from the other accounts of Mark in the Bible she was. And uh, that the uh, some believe, or tradition says, that the Garden of Gethsemane was uh, on Mark's mother's property. And that was the reason that Christ re resorted there. I don't know if that's true, but I'm quite sure that this uh, young man that we have here would be Mark. There's evidence later on in the Bible that Mark was present at the time of, uh, uh, at this time. All right, let's go to Luke now, Luke chapter 22. See what we find there. Remember, whereas uh, Matthew presents Christ as the king and Mark as the servant, and in Mark everything uh, moves very rapidly. And did you notice this? There is no account of the birth, of the genealogy, the birth, or the childhood of Christ in the book of Mark. It would be out of place. Who cares about the pedigree or the birth of a servant? And he starts right out with his work. In the very first chapter of Mark, we start with his work. This is in keeping. Some people say, I remember one time soon after I was saved, I uh, recognized that a certain uh, pastor uh, didn't believe in the virgin birth. And uh, he says, well, why should I? He says, two of the gospel writers didn't even believe in it. He says, Matthew and John, uh, Matthew and Luke believed in it, and Mark and John didn't. I say, why do you say that? And he says, well, if they'd have believed in it, wouldn't they, if they thought it was important, would they have mentioned it? No, they wouldn't have mentioned it, because it, 
it would be out of place, you see. Certainly in Mark, and you'll see why it would be in John. You, you're not interested in the pedigree, the birth, uh, the genealogy, and the childhood of a servant. You want to know, can he do the job? And he starts right out in the very first chapter of Mark doing the job. Because Mark describes him as the servant. Now in Luke, it's an entirely different thing. In Luke, you have all the human interest stories. And you have all the, the interesting details about the birth. And if you read the Christmas story, you always read it from Luke, don't you? And did you ever notice this? The genealogy in Luke is his human genealogy through Mary. And it goes all the way back to Adam. It, we don't find that the son of Abraham, the son of David. No, it starts with Adam, the son of Adam. And carries his genealogy, his holy genealogy down. Well, now, if you're going to tell the story of a human being, you always tell about uh, where he came from and his ancestors, don't you? If you're going to do a biography, certainly. It's part of the human interest part of his life. And did you ever think about the fact that Luke is the only place where you can find any reference to the childhood of Christ? The story concerning his childhood? And wherever you go in Luke, you'll find the details of Christ's life, the human interest part of them. Because in Luke we have, Behold the man, the humanity of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. And we would expect to find that type of detail in Luke. Now, Luke is not a very long account, but it has some aspects that we don't find elsewhere. We're looking in Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse 47. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them. Now, you're not told this elsewhere. Uh, other places. You know that Judas came, and Judas came with a great multitude, but you didn't know until you read it in Luke that Judas went out ahead of them. This is very important if you're going to understand the exact sequence of what went on that night. Uh, he, was, uh, he was walking ahead. Did you ever wonder why, uh, how, Luke, uh, how Judas knew exactly where to find Christ? None of these accounts have told us, have they? Wait till we get to John. It's all here, you see, if we put it all together. But we find here that Judas was out before them, and it doesn't say he kissed him, it says he drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. He drew near unto Jesus to Christ, uh, kiss him, but before Judas could kiss Christ, Christ said something. Now in the Matthew account, remember, he said something after he was kissed. Judas kissed him, and then he said, Friend, why are you come? But here we find Christ saying something before the kiss. He said something to Judas before the kiss and after the kiss. And you wouldn't know that if you didn't read it in both Gospels, would you? But here's what he said. He said, before he was ever kissed, he said, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss. He drew near to kiss him. Jesus said, Judas, are you going to betray me with a kiss? 49th verse. When they who were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Now, this is of human interest. You won't find it elsewhere. You don't find it in any of the other accounts where the disciples ask the question. So we use our swords? This is such a human thing to do. 50th verse. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Which ear? Right here. Well, isn't that an interesting little detail? We didn't find that out in Matthew or Mark, did we? And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far, and he touched his ear and healed him. You wouldn't have known that from Matthew or Mark, would you? That the ear was healed. Did you ever think about the fact that Luke was a doctor? Isn't that interesting? That's a human interest, isn't it? 52nd verse. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders who were come to him, Are ye come out as, a, as against a thief with sword and staves? When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hand against me. 
But this is your hour and the power of darkness. And you find this phrase only in Luke. Now John, John chapter 18. John, remember, is the gospel where Christ is presented as God the Son. And in John, how does it begin? With the birth of Christ? No, you'll never find the birth of Christ mentioned in John because John says, he tells about the inception of Christ as God. The beginningless beginning. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. It would be entirely out of place for John to begin with humanity or with the birth of Christ. Because John is presenting that which Christ was before he was ever man. That's why you don't find the birth of Christ in John. John chapter 18, verse 2. And Judas also, who betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus often resorted there with his disciples. So we fit in another detail, didn't we, that we didn't have in any of the other three Gospels. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers, now, we didn't know before this that there were soldiers involved. We knew that there were scribes and chief priests and elders of the people and a great multitude, but we didn't know that there were Roman soldiers came to get them. We didn't know that until we were told here in John, a band of men and officers, these were, these were soldiers, from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh there with lanterns and torches and weapons. We didn't know they had lanterns and torches either, did we? Isn't it interesting how the details are fit in in each place? Jesus, therefore, knowing all things, does that describe just a man? Knowing all things? Does it describe a servant? It doesn't even describe a king, does it? Does it describe God? Knowing all things. Oh, don't you see this? Don't you see how this story of the betrayal of Christ cements in our mind that this that we found in the Old Testament prophetically is coming so before our eyes here? How much more these Gospels will mean to you as you read them and search them out if you'll look for this in each story, in each of the Gospels as you read them. And this is the whole, this is the whole idea of this Bible study series we have here. It's not so much to teach us things as to just intrigue us with this great word of God that we'll spend the time that otherwise would be spent in front of the television tube watching uh, all of this uh, business there and, and uh, reading all of this uh, trash in the newspapers and all the magazines and everything. We'll get into God's book and we'll thrill in what our God has done here. That's the purpose of these Bible study series. Fourth verse, Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? He never asked the multitude this in the other gospels, did he? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said unto them, I am he, and Judas also who betrayed him stood with them. Now, in Luke it said Judas went out before them. And here it says Judas, Judas is standing with them. Isn't that interesting? Seems as though it were a contradiction, doesn't it? But wait till we get all through here. Sixth verse. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Who did? A whole bunch of them. Is this possible? Just by the word of a mouth? Is this possible? For a servant to do? For a man? Or even a king? We'll come back to that because it, it deserves some more attention. Seventh verse. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled of, of which he spoke, of them whom thou gavest me, I have lost none. And all of this is new to us here. Now watch. 
ten. Then Simon Peter. Why, we wouldn't have known who yielded that sword if John hadn't written that this incident with us. We didn't find it in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, did we? No, didn't tell us. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off the right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. We wouldn't have known that either, would we? And two of them tell us that it was the right ear, but only Luke told us that the ear was healed. We're not, we don't find that here. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the, the sheep. And here are words that we didn't read before. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captains and the, uh, the officers of the Jews took him and bound him. Now let's go back for a moment to this phrase here about them uh, falling to the ground. Back in the sixth verse, as soon then as he said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Notice the word he is in italics, isn't it? If you have a King James uh, version of the Bible, the word he is probably, now there are a few editions that aren't. How many here have the word he in italics there in your Bible? Look around now. If you don't, you'll see that most of them do. The word he is in italics. Now, this is one of the beautiful things about the King James Version. When the translator inserts the word, he puts it in italics so that you might be on guard. Now, the translator does this because one language doesn't fit exactly into another language, and so when you're translating, you need to insert certain words to make sense in your own language. And the translators have done that for us, but many times uh, they should have left it uninserted. But if they did here, it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't make a good sentence, would it? If we read in the sixth verse again, As soon then as he said unto them, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. That is not a good sentence, is it? That's not good grammar, is it? Well, let's look back in the eighth chapter of John and see, uh, see uh, about that. How about this? Now here the translator had a, a real problem. There was a controversy here between the religious leaders in Christ there in Jerusalem in uh, John chapter 8. Verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced it to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham, who of course lived fourteen hundred and some years previously. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. That doesn't make good grammar either, does it? Before Abraham was, I am. Well, try putting a he there. Before Abraham was, I am he. That doesn't make sense either. So the poor translator, he was at a loss what to do, so he left it like it was. There. He should have left it like it was the other place. You'll see when we get through it. Now, notice the reaction of the crowd when Jesus Christ said, I am. Verse 59, they took then took they up stones to cast at him. Why did they do that? Why did they take up stones to cast at him? Well, we're told the answer to that in chapter 10, verse 31. John 10, 31. Or, or 30. John 10, 30. I and my Father are one. He's saying, I, I'm the same as God. 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him again. See, they did it the first time when he said, I am. And the second time they did it when he said, I and the Father are one. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Now, the... the Jewish law says that if anyone held himself out as God, he should be stoned to death. And this is exactly what they should have done to, to Christ if he wasn't God. And they didn't believe that he was. So they took up stones to stone him. Twice. Once when he said, I am. And the once when he said, I and the Father are one. They recognized on both of those occasions that he was claiming to be God. Now, how did they know that he was claiming to be God when he said, before Abraham was, I am? 
Well, the answer to that is back in the third chapter of Exodus. And if you don't uh, want to go back with us, okay, but I'm going to go back and show you uh, where that comes from. Exodus chapter 3. You'll recall the, uh, the setting here. The children of Israel were in captivity in Egypt as slaves, and God had called Moses to deliver them. And Moses had given several excuses, and one of his excuses was this. God, I can't go deliver the children of Israel because they won't believe me. And he says, well, Moses, you tell them that I sent you. But who will I say sent me? I'm going to there and say, look, God sent me, and he says, get out of here. They'll, they'll uh, mock me to laughter. But look what God said. Uh, Exodus 3.14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. This word I am is the eternal name of Jehovah God. And the Jesus Christ of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He always has been I am. He is I am now. He always will be I am. This is his the eternal God's name. This is what he calls himself. Now many scriptures in the Old Testament will open up for you if you understand this. For instance, John 13, 13. Uh, where uh, you need to turn to all these because we're running out of time. But he said there to the disciples in the upper room, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for I am. Now, they inserted that little word so, but that's not in the original. And, and here's something interesting. If you read the Matthew account of, Je of Jesus walking on the water, and that uh, they were all fearful, you know, do you know what he said? If you read it in the King James Version, he said, it is I. But if you read it in the original, it's the same phrase. He said, when uh, they were fearful, he called out, I am. And many of the, the uh, scriptures will open up for you. Well, what is the significance of this? Well, Jesus is saying, I am. I'm God. Now, let's go back to our story that we had. If we put all of these accounts together, we would find something like this. That Jesus Christ, after he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, recognized the fact that Judas was coming because he was God and he knew everything. And so he started out somewhat ahead of the apostles who were in the garden with him. He walked out to meet the crowd that was coming. And here was the crowd coming towards him. Uh, there was quite a motley bunch and you wouldn't know all of them that were there unless you read all the accounts. Uh, there was the chief priests, there were the elders of the people, there were the captains of the temple, there were the scribes, uh, there were the great multitudes of ordinary people, and there were uh, Roman soldiers with their officers. All that group. And they were coming with all types of weapons and with lanterns and torches. And as they were coming, Judas was out in front of them away, sort of leading them. And as Judas looked in the distance, he saw Christ coming towards him, and he said, Hail, Master. And he went up towards him. And as he drew near, 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 he started to kiss Christ. And Christ said, at that moment, he said, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? But you see, we're told then that Judas had already told them that he would identify the, the one that was to be taken by the kiss. And uh, so he was going to have to go through with his bargain, even though it didn't quite fit at that place. He was going to have to go through with it because he wanted his 30 pieces of silver, and this was the bargain he'd made. So he went ahead and kissed him, even though Christ said, Judas, betrayest thou me with a kiss. And after he kissed him, Christ said, friend, why are you come? And Judas didn't answer. He rushed back to the people. I guess he wanted to get back with those soldiers and things. 
he watched back and stood with them for their protection, you might say. And Christ, looking at this great aggregation of multitudes and so forth, he said, Why are you come? Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And when they said, Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I am! And immediately the whole bunch of them fell flat on their backs on the ground. Because God Almighty had spoken. And that's a prophetic of the time that's coming. When he's going to come back from heaven's glory, riding with all the heavenly hosts, and with all the armies of the world will be gathered against Jerusalem in that great event that we call the Battle of Armageddon. And it says that he's going to slay the whole bunch of them with the word of his mouth and as immediately as he says be slain, it says their flesh is going to disintegrate and their eyes will uh, disintegrate in their sockets and uh, the whole bunch of them will just, just be obliterated by the word of his mouth, the sword of his mouth, which is his word. He didn't need to call 10, uh, 12 legions of angels. All he needed to say was, I am. And if he'd have wanted to, he could have slain, slain every one of them with those words. But trembling, that uh, group of people scrambled their feet, probably not realizing what had really happened to them. And as they scrambled to their feet, up comes Peter and the rest of the disciples, and he says again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, Well, let these fellows go. And Peter comes rushing up, and he says, Lord, says, uh, uh, shall we uh, smite them with a sword? And he, uh, without getting an answer, he rushes on forward, and he hacks with his sword, and and off comes the guy's ear. He, I guess he wanted to take advantage of them when they were still trying to recuperate from having been thrown to the ground by the words of God Almighty. Doesn't your heart bleed for people that can't see God is here? Don't, doesn't your heart bleed for, for even ministers of the gospel who can't tell whether or not these words are God's words or not? It's no problem for us to believe that when he said, I am, they fell flat on the ground, is it? Then you see, Christ kind of brushed Peter said and said, no, just let it be now, Peter. Suffer it to be so. And he healed the ear of the servant first. And then he said, well, if you're looking for me, why don't you let these others go? And they fled. They all ran. And they grabbed Christ, and they grabbed the young man, and uh, they got his clothes, but they didn't get him. And then Christ said to them, he says, why do you come out here with staves and all these things? I was in the temple teaching. You could have picked me up any time. Now, this whole story will not make sense if you don't take all of the gospel and blend it together. For I'll assure you, if you just take Matthew and Mark and John and leave out Luke, the story will contradict itself. And if you just take Matthew, Mark, and Luke and leave out John, the story will contradict itself. But if you'll take the whole four of them together and blend them beautifully get together, you'll see what happens that night. And all of it. And you'll never know unless you read it in all the accounts. And every story that's in all four of the Gospels is that same way. You wouldn't know what Jesus Christ said in those hours when he hung on, hung on the cross if you only read one Gospel or only two Gospels because the sayings of Christ from the cross are recorded in the separate Gospel accounts. Now do you see why we have more, more than one Gospel? You say, well, why did God break up the story like this? Oh, for one reason, because he's God. And because man doesn't write like this. Man would never, never, I don't care how far you look, you'll never find a human author that would put a story together like this. Never. There is no such thing as human literature. And it helps you to know that God has spoken. I know it. God has spoken. And it's his way. And, and see the sense of it? Besides showing forth so many different things, for instance, taking the same story and presenting Christ in so many different ways. 
And also, if you really want to know how God says things, you're going to have to spend more time than you've been spending reading his word, aren't you? Or you're never really going to know because you see, the feeding of the 5,000 is in all four Gospels. And the story of the crucifixion is in, in all four Gospels. And many other stories. And some that aren't in all four are in three. And uh, you should uh, inquire. When you see a story in three of the Gospels and it's not in the other one, you should say, why isn't a particular Gospel and not in the other? See how much worthwhile time we could spend if we really wanted to. Well, this same one that spoke there on that night with such force speaks today. He speaks today. And men are still refusing his words, although we're told very plain in, in the book of Hebrews. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. I wonder if there's anyone here in this room who is refusing the one that speaketh. I mean, in the first place, you're refusing to come to him as he comes to you lowly, having salvation. Have you refused him? Or maybe you come to him as the Savior, but you refuse to bow down under this great one with the word of his mouth could slay an entire army. Oh, the, the foolhardiness of so many Christians that live their own lives, ruling their own selves, when there's such a one to whom we could be subservient, when there's such a one from whom we can hear words, he still speaks. And men still refuse him to speak it. But one day, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall proclaim that he is Lord of lords and King of kings, to the glory of God. How I thank my God that he taught me to proclaim him Lord, God, King, willingly and gladly, rather than one day. At the wrong time, to be forced to cry out, utter with these steps, sure, he is God. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this wondrous book. Thank you for these that have come. And dear God, we pray earnestly that this will just be the, the new beginning in many lives here, that this will be the foundation that will cause them to seek out your word, and that many here will say, Surely, God, I have sinned, and that I have not properly regarded your word. I have sinned, and that I have not 